All right, so we all know what we're here for. Napoleon's Endgame, France, 1814. So we're coming very close to the end of this series. We have one more video after this, which is Waterloo. So here's an important announcement. I will try to react to the 1870 Waterloo movie after the 1815 Waterloo video comes out. That link in the video should be a time card now. If it's still, if it actually went up, you can go watch the reaction to that movie. It'll also be at the end of this uh, video if it is out and if it is working. Everything is indicating to me that it should be working. Lastly, uh, if you like this video, I'm going to be pausing. This video is going to be over an hour long. Please leave me a like and leave a comment of some description. Uh, it really helps the channel out since we are very small. And I again thank all my Patreon supporters, which are above me. And we will continue on to Napoleon's finest defensive campaign that he ever waged. So let's get to it. Peace. Peace. It's easy enough to say the word. Am I giving up all that I possess in Germany? Napoleon to count Bugonat. Paris, November 1813. In October 1813, Napoleon had suffered his heaviest ever defeat at Leipzig, the Battle of the Nations. Surviving French forces, exhausted, sick and demoralised, retreated to the River Rhine and prepared to defend France from invasion. The Battle for France. Um, whatever guys got out of the Battle of Nations was not many, because a lot of them were left behind because Napoleon was not was not on his A-game there. And now this is a defense for France. And you're going to have to remember, most of these guys are conscripts. So now, if you have a conscript fighting away from their own territory, they're not going to do very well. If they're fighting for their homeland and they are in their homeland, they have pretty decent morale. But in November... The armies of the Sixth Coalition paused their advance, and Austrian Foreign Minister Metternich offered peace terms. The Frankfurt proposals would allow Napoleon to keep his throne if France returned to her so-called natural frontiers. It was the best offer Napoleon was likely to get. It is the only offer he's going to get, and it is the best offer. You take this deal. They. Everyone on the coalition side knew that if they had to go into France, they were going to lose thousands, tens of thousands of troops in this campaign to take down Napoleon. They wanted to try peace. One last time, this Frankfurt proposal is basically France to its natural borders, and even this is still pretty extensive um, for France. This includes also the rain, I almost guarantee you, and some parts of well, actually, this is a lot of Belgium, because um, Belgium doesn't exist at this time, and this is also some parts of the Netherlands up here. This is very, very extensive for uh, French territory. But Napoleon's not going to accept it. <laughs> he will die on his horse. He is a military man, and he's going to die a military man. If he only wanted to expand France to this, he would have done so a long time ago. But... Natural frontiers. It was the best offer Napoleon was likely to get now that his back was to the wall, and all Europe's great powers were united against him. Even so, he did not accept the terms. He merely agreed to reopen negotiations. To the Allies, and many in France itself, it proved that Napoleon would not listen to reason. The war went on, and by January 1814, Napoleon's situation looked even worse. That is actually key what the Allies did there. It's a very quick mention. They sent these peace terms to France, to him, and he rejected it outright, basically. That is going to stir a lot of things going on in France. Remember, Napoleon's grip of power has always been tenuous at best because he has to keep continuously going back to Paris, as we've seen through this entire series, to stabilize his, basically, the grumblings of powerful people in Paris. So now that these powerful people in Paris know 
that France is going to go down because Napoleon doesn't want to agree to peace terms. There's going to be some uppity rebellions that are going to affect this 1814 campaign, needless to say. And even a few generals and marshals are going to be affected by him refusing these deals. Again, if they had just invaded France and not offered any terms at this point, most of the soldiers, most of the people would have backed Napoleon because, again, you're fighting on your homeland. They're not going to question it. But now they have been given peace terms, quite generous peace terms, to keep everything in France, not be invaded, and Napoleon keeps his, his throne. But again, he still refuses. So it's very smart what the Allies did there to turn some of uh, Napoleon's supporters into his opposition. Many of his besieged garrisons in the east were starved into surrender. Marshal Davout, with 34,000 men in Hamburg, was now besieged. Denmark, one of France's last allies, was invaded by Bernadotte's Swedish army and made to join the coalition. French troops evacuated the Netherlands, which reasserted its independence after nearly 20 years of French control. In if I remember correctly, it's called the Bavarian Republic, or the... not Bavarian. Bavarian Republic. I could be wrong, but yeah, they were basically just a French puppet. In Italy, Eugène's army faced a new enemy. Joachim Mura, king of Naples, now marching north with 30,000 men to honor his new alliance with the Sixth Coalition. In Paris, Napoleon responded to the crisis with a series of extreme measures. Property taxes doubled, state salaries and pensions suspended, 300,000 new conscripts called up from a country already exhausted by 20 years of war. Think about that. He's able to call up 300,000 conscripts. Whether these people wanted to fight or not is irrelevant. They are fighting for their home now. Now, we Americans have fought for our home a few times. Uh, our American Revolution and really the War of 1812. Past that, we really haven't had to defend our homeland um, we have been attacked on our homeland. That's a little different. We have 9-11 and we have Pearl Harbor. We have not been invaded really since our revolution. In the War of 1812, you could say that. Um, so it's a little bit different. Again, not saying American morale was like trash or anything. It's one of the best in the world today. Um, but we have professional soldiers and everything. But again, conscripts fighting for your homeland. Many Europeans can probably attest to this. If you are fighting in your homeland, your morale is much higher um, than it would otherwise be. Because you're fighting for your family, you're fighting for your home, fighting for everything basically you have. He ordered the release of Pope Pius, under French house arrest for the last five years, to try to shore up his support in Italy. That house arrest is a very... Uh, makes pisses off a lot of Catholics. Let's just say that. France is a Catholic nation. The Kingdom of Italy is a Catholic nation. They are very pissed that the Pope is under house arrest. So this is a little concession to them. Whatever that will do. He even agreed to release Fernando, the Bourbon King of Spain, to take up his throne in exchange for peace between France and Spain. A condition that Fernando was in no position to honor. Because he was technically a prisoner of Napoleon, you can't honor an alliance if you are... You can't really do anything if you're a prisoner. You can't negotiate. It's the same thing um, today, where if you're under distress and you sign a contract, that contract is null and void. It's the exact same thing. But these concessions were too little, far too late. In January, two coalition armies crossed the Rhine into France. Blücher's Army of Silesia and Schwarzenberg's Army of Bohemia. Outnumbered French forces in their path could only fall back. On the 25th of January, Napoleon said farewell to his wife and son at the Tuileries Palace, before leaving for the front. He would never see either of them again. With and that's a sad truth. He knew that this was it. You either win or you die here, and he will not see the both of them again, um, even his exile. Just 70,000 men he faced odds of four to one. 
He has as many <laughs> men as the army of Silesia has with 70,000. Again, when I say Nap this is Napoleon at his finest in a defensive campaign, this is it. This is end game. 70,000 men. He faced odds of four to one. Most of his troops were raw conscripts, some without uniforms, many just learning how to hold a musket. But for the first time in years, Napoleon's army was so small that he'd be able to exercise direct command over all its movements. The result would be one of the most audacious and brilliant campaigns in history. And that's true because his army was around 70,000 people. Um, and again, that is remarkably small compared to the Grand Army of 600,000 people going into Russia. It's quite small, but he can maneuver it now, basically under his entire command with his marginal executing orders that he gives directly. If the enemy are foolish enough to cross the Rhine, I will march to meet them. Then you will see the meaning of the word debacle. <laughs> I think that's debacle. I clearly passed English. Napoleon to Count Bergenot, Paris, November 1813. Well, they did cross the Rhine. The battle for France would be fought east of Paris, mostly across Champagne, a flat region divided by the rivers Marne and Seine and their tributaries. In late January, fields were dusted with snow and roads quickly turned to mud. Napoleon learned that the coalition armies were widely scattered, with part of Blücher's army near Napoleon's old college at Brienne. The it's near his old college. He knows the terrain. He knows the terrain damn well if that's his old college. Again, all these commanders here, they, I mean, basically this is France. This is their homeland. They should know where the terrain is, where pieces are going to fight. And of course, breaking up your big army to smash little things because you think you've already won is not a very good idea. Napoleon's going to be able to concentrate and smash these smaller segments. If they were all grouped up in one army, he really couldn't do much. But. The emperor advanced rapidly, hoping to trap and destroy part of Blücher's army. But after a hard day's fighting that cost both sides 3,000 casualties, Blücher was able to retreat towards Schwarzenberg's army. That evening, Napoleon was nearly skewered by a charging Cossack, saved only by General Gorgo's good shooting. That's pretty good. Uh, a general actually shooting well, that, that is kind of very impressive. That's very impressive today, I'll just say that. As Napoleon tried to work out the enemy's movements, Blücher, heavily reinforced by Schwarzenberg, made a surprise attack at La Rothière. Allied troops advanced through swirling snow to assault the village, defiantly held by young French conscripts. One was so inexperienced that Marshal Marmont had to personally show him how to load his musket during the battle. Now that is absolutely crazy. These guys were just called up from their whatever, shops, farms, whatever, handed a rifle and said, good luck. <laughs> when a marshal has to show you how to load a rifle, he, he, things are really bad. By late afternoon, Vreda's Bavarian Corps was falling on Napoleon's flank. Heavily outnumbered, Napoleon had no option but to retreat, having lost 5,000 casualties and 73 guns abandoned in the thick mud. Those 73 guns he can't replace. That's a massive loss of material. The Allies' frontal attacks meant their losses were greater, but by combining their armies, they defeated Napoleon on French soil for the first time. Believing Napoleon would now retreat towards Paris, the Allies decided to advance along two routes to ease pressure on the roads. Blücher would take a northern route along the Marne. Schwarzenberg would follow the Seine. But dividing their armies again would play right into Napoleon's hands. This is them getting overconfident that, that this is it. 
I, I get the fact that this eases the supply burden because, again, we are in winter. Um, and this is going to ease the supply burden instead of eating all the food here um, from the main road loop from foraging, which is basically and stealing food from people, villages. This is what you do. But they're getting overconfident again. And they think they beat Napoleon on his own home, own home soil, so they're going to split up, and he's still in the game. study of it has given me a greater idea of his genius than any other. The Duke of Wellington on Napoleon's 1814 campaign. Think about that. The study of it has given me a greater idea of his genius than any other. He is complimenting Napoleon on this campaign. And this photo right here should very well summarize uh, what is going on. He, and I'm assuming this is Berthier, are planning out what the hell, what they are going to do. Um, and everyone is just trying to get some rest eye in there. If this... I like this illustration. And I think the illustration perfectly sums up 1814 campaign. After two days to reorganize, Napoleon continued his retreat to Nogent, where he learned that the Allies had split their armies. Not only that, they were advancing at different speeds. The aggressive Blücher racing ahead, while the more cautious Schwarzenberg lagged behind. Leaving Oudinot and Victor to guard the Seine bridges and delay Schwarzenberg, Napoleon raced north through mud and rain with 30,000 men. He has 30,000 men versus Blucher's outnumbers him, and he's going to send uh, two of his generals slash marshals to hold the Seine River. Because Schwarzenberg, Schwarzenberg uh, is going to be slow, and again, the crossing points are at Nargat and Mardu, it looks like. Um, and maybe we're six... Yeah, Sixth Corps is, but Sixth Corps is withdrawing. Um, and that makes sense. He's going to go attack the man that is very fast and be able to deal with the man that's slow later. To guard the Seine bridges and delay Schwarzenberg, Napoleon raced north through mud and rain with 30,000 men. The army of Silesia was strung out on the march. He has 30,000 men, but as you can see, this army is completely strung out. 8,000, 7,000, 3,700, 18 thousand twenty thousand he can smash each one of these and that will be called defeat in detail smash these things um so you can that's how you basically went against a big army defeat in detail smash smaller engage enemy in smaller fronts with your superior forces so we get thirty thousand versus twenty thousand to win and keep doing that oblivious to the danger it was in first napoleon fell on general osufiev's russian ninth corps at champaubert destroying it I want you to take a look. He has the six core. He has the young and old guard. These are his best units possible. Six core is probably some of the best guys too. He he has everyone at the best guys that he possibly can have. Taking its commander and 2,000 men prisoner. The next morning, he marched on General Austin Sacken's force near Montmiral. This was a much larger force with two infantry and one cavalry corps. And he has his young guard and old guard sent six core to delay Blucher best troops fighting <laughs> his best guys are fighting whatever he has in front of him and was expecting support from york's prussian first corps but the prussians were late and sacken's troops could not withstand the french onslaught at this desperate hour the emperor's elite old guard were no longer held back but were often thrown into the thick of the fighting by the end of the day Napoleon had inflicted another three and a half thousand casualties, twice his own losses, and the Allies were in rapid retreat. That's it. You need to send in your old guard. You can't hold back at this point. We we are. This is the end game. This is Avengers End Game. He sends in his old guard because he knows that this is it. You we need to smash these guys fast before Blucher can come up here and reinforce them. So again, he's sending in his best troops with the bear skins, because I, kn I knew as soon as I saw these bear skins, I knew they were old guard. Shorties, twice his own losses, and the Allies were in rapid retreat. Napoleon had ordered Marshal Macdonald to cut off the enemy's escape by seizing the Marne Bridge at Chateau Thierry. But York's Prussians got there first. The next day, Napoleon could only batter their rear guard as the enemy fled across the Marne destroying the bridge behind them. Sending Marshal Mortier to rebuild the bridge and continue the pursuit, 
Napoleon doubled back to rejoin Marmont, who had been left to keep watch on Blücher. And now he's defeated these two armies, he needs to hit Blücher as fast as possible. He he roughly can either have as many forces as Blücher, and that will give him... The, I mean, that's going to be his only advantage, if that. It's going to be a real stalemate, but he needs to get as many guys in here. He's got the Young Guard and the Sixth Corps with him. Napoleon attacked at Vauchamp, using General Grouchy's cavalry to outflank Blücher's army, which was soon in headlong retreat. A merciless French pursuit inflicted 6,000 Prussian and Russian casualties. Napoleon lost just 600 men. Let me go back real quick on that number real quick. But these are Polish Uhlans. So the, this is the Polish Uhlan uniform. Um, this is what they wore. Inflicted 6,000 Prussian and Russian casualties. Napoleon lost just 600 men. Napoleon had... That is incredible numbers um, on your side. You lose 600 and you take 6,000 of them out and you are the attacker. That is insane. Again, Napoleon at his finest in a defensive campaign. Taken on an enemy army almost twice his size and beaten it four times in just six days. Blücher had lost an estimated 15,000 casualties in battle and another 15,000 in smaller engagements as stragglers or deserters. Look at these numbers. From just the 10th of 15, Napoleon had 30,000. This is Blucher's army of Silesia. This is just in the general area. He didn't go fight 57,000 and win in a battle. Again, he lost 600 here. They lost 3,000. 2,000 here, 3,700. He lost 500 and they lost 2,700. 600, that's 6,000. Again, he is stacking the bodies here. For now, the army of Silesia had been scattered and neutralized. But in the south, Marshals Victor and Udino had not been able to prevent Schwarzenberg's Army of Bohemia from crossing the Seine in three places. Austrian troops were now just 40 miles from Paris. They are 40 miles from Paris, and here's the difference between Paris and, for example, Washington DC for my American viewers. If Washington DC falls, every American knows, oh well. If New York City is lost, that is a massive blow to us Americans. Paris is like the New York City um, for France. You lose it, it's over. It's like London for England. Uh, the capital is basically the biggest city. So they have to defend Paris, no matter what. The US, yeah, DC falls, oh well. Uh, uh, strategically, you know, 500,000 people, that's sad but it's not a major blow like New York City or uh, Los Angeles or Dallas would be. 40 miles is very short. Just from the tactical view of, I don't know what's gonna happen, he needs to get over here. He's gonna have to rapidly get everyone he can and intercept the army coming here. He can't afford to not defend Paris, so he's going to engage Swashenberg. He's going to engage him down here or near uh, Guggenis, this village right here. That's the only thing I can see possibly him happening. Leaving Mortier and Marmont to keep watch on Blücher, Napoleon raced south. Schwarzenberg, alarmed by news of Blücher's defeat and of Napoleon's approach, immediately ordered a retreat. It was too late for Wittgenstein's advance guard, routed at Mormain with 2,000 casualties. Napoleon sent Victor's second corps to seize the bridge at Montereau but was so infuriated by its slow progress that he sacked Victor and gave his corps to General Gerard. You're not moving fast enough. He's within his right to sack the commander, and he did so. And I mean, this is no time for you to be playing around. This is for, this is for France. This is for the homeland. The next day at the Battle of Montereau, the French drove the Allied Württemberg Corps back across the river with 30% losses. According to some accounts, the Emperor sighted the French cannon himself, as he had at Lodi 18 years before. This is what I mean. This is Napoleon at his finest. This account of, uh, you know, as long as it can be true, but again, he sights the cannon himself just like he did 18 years ago. He was an artillery officer before he was anything else. And this is showing that he's still got and he knows how important this stuff is. Um, and especially for him to be with the men. I mean, it's going to raise their morale. 
some accounts, the Emperor sighted the French cannon himself, as he had at Lodi 18 years before. Napoleon had the Allies on the run. But how long could it last? Recollect what your military position is. If we act with military and political purdice, prudence, wow, I can spell English, how can France resist a just demand by 600,000 warriors? Let her, if she dare. British Foreign Secretary, Sir, Secretary Lord Castlereagh to Metternich, 18th of February, 1814. The 600,000 warriors, by the way, are the coalition, so yeah, they're pretty outnumbered. Even as fighting continued, negotiations between France and the coalition reopened at Châtillon-sur-Seine on the 5th of February. The Allied terms were now more severe. A return to France's frontiers of 1791, which meant the additional loss of Belgium, a humiliation that Napoleon refused to accept. And I mean, again, even he could have taken the, the deal in 1813 and that was a very good deal which included everything up to basically just france whatever it had left in its outer exterior now we're talking about actual french territories um they're gonna lose the rhineland um here but again this is still pretty extensive and he'll get to keep his throne and he gets to keep everything else but he's still gonna say no just like napoleon would instead he tried to revive the frankfurt proposals hoping to play for time and to split the coalition, whose war aims varied from Britain's hard line to Austria's more ambiguous position. But this hope was thwarted by British Foreign Secretary Lord Castlereagh. On the 1st of March, he persuaded the Allies to sign the Treaty of Chaumont. In it, Russia, Prussia, Austria and Great Britain agreed to keep 150,000 troops in the field and not to negotiate separately with France. Well, this is like the Tehran conference for uh, the US, the UK and the Soviets in World War II. Basically, it said we will each not sign a separate peace until Germany is down. We will we will only accept unconditional surrender from Germany and we will not sign any separate pieces. So let's read this. Number one, Russia, Prussia, Austria and Great Britain solemnly engaged by the present treaty to apply all the means of their respective states to the vigorous prosecution of a of the war against France. It is understood that the court, courts of England, Austria, Russia, and Prussia engaged by the present treaty to keep in the field each of them 150,000 men, so each state 150, 150, 150, 150. Okay, that is that's 600,000 men, exclusive of garrisons to be employed. So this is this means excluding garrisons. So it's 150,000 men excluding garrisons um, to be employed in active service against the common enemy, which is France. Number two. The high contracting parties engage not to treat separately with the common enemy, nor to sign peace, truce, or nor convention, but with common consent, which means everyone has to agree. They, moreover, engage not to lay down their arms until the objective of the war, mutually understood and agreed upon, shall have been attained, which was Napoleon is off the throne and the restoration of the Bourbon monarchy. Three, His Britannic Majesty engages is to furnish a subsidy of five million pounds of the service of the year 1814 to divide an equal proportion among the powers. Wow, that is an incredible amount of money for the time. That will bankrupt. I'm almost certain that will bankrupt. I mean, Britain's pretty much almost broke at this point, but that will <laughs> break it back. While Britain added the sweetener of a five million pound subsidy to be shared among the allies. The treaty's secret articles specified common war aims, including the future independence of the German states, Switzerland and Italy, while Spain was to be returned to the Bourbons and Holland to the House of Orange. Read this. So this is the secret um, thing. Secret. Oh my gosh. The secret articles. <laughs> okay, yes, yeah, so it's called secret articles, March 1st. Okay, so let's look at this. Their imperial and royal majesties obligate themselves to direct their efforts towards the actual establishment of the following system in Europe, to wit. First, 
Germany, composed of sovereign princes united by a federation, federative bond with assurances and guarantees their independence of Germany. Basically, this is going to be the confederation, uh, the German confederation. But this is a whole separate issue that we'll, we can watch later um, with what's going to happen after the treaty. But basically, all the German states are going to confederate into a defensive alliance. Not offensive, just defensive. Um, and guarantee each other's independence after this war. Um, so not in HRE, but something else. Two, the Swiss Confederation and its former limits and an independent place under the guarantee of the great powers of Europe, France included. Basically, Swiss is restored. Everyone is guaranteeing them. So if anybody attacks Switzerland, Switzerland has four other great powers to come to their aid. Three, Italy divided into independent states, intermediaries between the Austrian possessions in Italy and France. Basically, this is so um, everyone doesn't lose their power. Austria has a significant influence in Italy at this point in time, and they want to keep that. Actually, they want to expand it well into um, uh, Venice. Um, and they do not want a strong united Italy. They want it divided so that they can maintain power over there. Number four, Spain governed by King Ferdinand uh, Seventh in its former limits. It's basically restoring the monarchy for... Spain. Five, Holland, free independent state under the sovereignty of the Prince of Orange with increases of territory and the establishment of a suitable frontier. Basically going to give them some more land so that they don't have to get... Technically, suitable frontier would technically mean like a frontier to fight on, so like land that would buy them time in case they ever were at war, but it just really means more land. Bonds and Holland to the House of Orange. The four powers even agreed that once they'd defeated Napoleon, they'd form a 20-year defensive alliance to maintain peace in Europe, a sign of their newfound commitment to each other. A split in the coalition had been Napoleon's last best hope for a favourable peace. That or he could have signed the peace treaty, you know, either one. <laughs> either one would have worked, uh, but he's not wrong there. There is actually a 20-year peace from 1815 until 1835, and actually that was a little bit longer if I remember correctly. Um, and yeah, it's a it's a good long peace. Uh, that's how much Europe was devastated by this war. That was gone. And news from across the country was bleak. French cities were surrendering to the Allies without a fight. Nancy, Dijon, and Macon had all fallen. In the south, Wellington defeated Marshal Soult at Ortez, forcing him to fall back on Toulouse. Two weeks later, as British troops approached the city of Bordeaux, it declared loyalty to France's Bourbon kings. The mayor himself rode out to greet the British, bearing a white cockade, the sign of Bourbon allegiance. Traitors! Traitors! I mean, you can't really fault them for this. I mean, they've been at war for around 20 years at this point. And again, remember what they, the coalition did in the beginning was they offered France an out. Um, they offered Napoleon an out so they didn't have to get invaded. And the people know about this. So. Napoleon's hope for a nation in arms to resist the Allies had not materialized. Allied troops, particularly Cossacks, often robbed French civilians and committed some atrocities. French peasants took revenge when they could. But there was no guerrilla war to mirror what French troops had encountered in Spain or Russia. The chief desire among ordinary French people was for peace, at almost any price. Yeah, peace at almost any price at this point. They've been 20 years. They were given an option. I mean, Napoleon was definitely given an option for peace, but you know, not going to happen. So people were like, look, it's not worth it. Danger uh, cow crowded upon him, encompassing him, oppressed him for every from every side, but he sought to escape from them by misrepresenting them to himself. Marquess de Colincourt, French foreign minister. Oh, wow, I bet you whatever French name that was. Any talk of Napoleon's defeat in late February was premature. 
The French Emperor was driving Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia before him, even though it was twice his size. But Schwarzenberg scrambled to safety behind the River Ob. Napoleon knew he had to land another decisive blow soon, so turned his attention back to Blücher. You can see here, Schwarzenberg is, is, has a tail between his legs and is running for his life. This is, since Blücher is a headstrong Prussian that will attack you no matter what, if he goes to Icarus, crosses there, or you can go um, where 7th, 7th Corps is across there um, and engage Blücher, that's what I would do too. After an aborted attempt to join forces with Schwarzenberg, Blücher had decided to resume his advance on Paris, gathering reinforcements en route, and with only Marmont and Mortier's weak corps to oppose him. Leaving Marshal Macdonald in command in the south, Macdonald is, will become the highest ranking French field marshal after the war. He is pretty good. I will say, I won't say he's one of the best marshals, but he's pretty good. And you see Montemur and six score versus all Bluger. And Bluger's going for it. He's going for the kill shot. He turned it sideways as a kill shot. He's going for Paris. Napoleon has to get back there no matter what. Napoleon set off to intercept Blücher, covering 60 miles in three days along terrible roads choked with mud. At Napoleon's approach, Blücher retreated across the Marne, burning the bridges behind him. 24 hours later, they'd been rebuilt by French engineers, and Napoleon was poised to crush Blücher against the Enne River, because the major crossing point at Soissons was held by a Franco-Polish garrison. But after just a day's fighting, the garrison commander at Soissons tamely surrendered allowing Blücher to escape. And if he had held on, Blücher would have had a fight to the end. There is no other, there is no escape there, but... Napoleon continued his pursuit across the Enne, still hoping to cut off the army of Silesia. But at Craon, he encountered Russian troops in a strong defensive position. The Russians fought stubbornly. The French finally forced the enemy to withdraw, but only at the cost of 6,000 casualties, including many irreplaceable veterans from Napoleon's guard. I mean, if they had survived up to this point, this, I'm not, I wouldn't be really concerned. I mean, the 6,000 casualties do hurt and the veterans on top of them that are not replaceable, but it's 1814. This is the final straw. You need to win no matter what. Napoleon pushed on to Long. But by now, Blücher had concentrated his forces, 98,000 troops in all, and outnumbered Napoleon two to one. French attacks were repulsed, while Marmont's corps was caught off guard by a late Allied counterattack and routed. Napoleon was lucky to avoid a much heavier defeat. Blücher, usually aggressive to the point of recklessness, was unwell and had been told Napoleon's army was twice as big as it was, leading him to act with unusual caution. Long was a heavy blow to Napoleon. Six and a half thousand casualties he could not afford. Undaunted, he fell back to Soissons, and after a brief moment to reorganize, he marched on the city of Reims, which had just fallen to Saint-Priest's Russian corps. In a whirlwind assault, Napoleon retook the city. Saint-Priest himself was mortally wounded, his corps routed. Now, Napoleon needs to continuously keep doing this. He doesn't have the numbers to face Blücher by himself. And again, Schwarzenberg is down there and he's going to keep moving. He, Napoleon knows in his head that if they both start working their way to Paris again, and he can't, he can't stop them, it's over. Meanwhile, in the south, Schwarzenberg had resumed his offensive as soon as he found out Napoleon had gone north. 
again, the strategy of take Napoleon's marshals out, okay? And this was developed by the King of Sweden, which was uh, formerly one of Napoleon's marshals. Hit his marshal, hit Napoleon's marshals, um, and don't fight Napoleon. And you can see that they're trying to do that. They're trying to pull back when Napoleon is there and then hit them when he's not. And again, he, he can't be everywhere. In heavy fighting, he'd driven Oudinot and Macdonald back from the River Ope. Five days later, the Allies had recaptured Troyes, as Macdonald retreated behind the River Seine. Now, after four days to rest and reorganise his battered army, Napoleon was coming south once more. Schwarzenberg, emboldened by news of Napoleon's defeat at Laon, decided that this time he would stand and fight. Napoleon advanced on Arcis sur Eube, ignoring reports that the enemy was not retreating as he believed, but gathering for battle. That is a problem with Schwarzenberg. The strategy was always we will retreat when Napoleon is here and we will not fight him. I mean, Schwarzenberg got his ass kicked by Napoleon not even a year ago. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but he does outnumber him, and if he's in a defensive position, he might be able to pull this off. But... As heavy fighting broke out, Napoleon still believed he faced only the enemy rearguard. It was a nasty surprise to discover that he faced the entire might of the Army of Bohemia. 28,000 men against 80,000. In desperate fighting, Napoleon personally rallied fleeing troops and exposed himself to enemy fire, having his horse killed under him by an exploding shell. But the odds were too great. Again, that's Napoleon at his finest. He's putting himself in danger. He is trying to rally the men. At the end of the second day, Napoleon was forced to order the retreat. Had a glorious death, dis disputing foot by foot the soil of the country. The balls flew around me. My cloth was pierced, but none reached me. Napoleon Bonaparte on the battle. Arquette de Sut Abu. I can't say that. Basically, he was trying to die, uh, but no, no bullet found him. Napoleon believed his army was now too weak to take on the Allies directly, so he decided to change strategy. He would march into the rear of the Allied armies, join up with some of his isolated garrisons, and cut the enemy's lines of communication, forcing them to abandon their advance on Paris. This is a ballsy and very risky move, okay? Napoleon is calculating this. He does not have enough men left to face the ES-26,000 guys, probably less by now. They, <laughs> 70, 80,000 here, another 70, 80,000 here. He doesn't have enough. But if he attacks their rear supply lines, they have to send guys back because otherwise their supply lines and communications are cut, right? And he can gather some of these forces um, up here in Luxembourg, Metz, Verdun, and maybe Nancy, um, and maybe even Mines. But this is very risky to do because if you cut them and they both advance on Paris, that's it. It's over. Uh, remember, Paris Paris falls in World War One. If Paris fell in World War One. France more than likely surrenders. If when Paris fell in World War II, France surrenders. If Paris gets touched here, it's over. France surrenders. So losing Paris, if they touch Paris, it's over. So this is a very big gamble he's going to try to embark upon. But the Allies, until now always one step behind Napoleon, had just received crucial information. Talleyrand. The most brilliant Talleyrand. I like I like Talleyrand. He will be very important in the peace conferences later. And he's a traitor. So French diplomat of the age and the most slippery. He'd served France's monarchy, the revolution, then Napoleon, until in 1807 he fell out irrevocably with the emperor over foreign policy. He 
he might be slippery, but he's a very good diplomat, and he knows how to play people. That's how he was able to serve in the revolution. No, sorry, the monarchy, the revolution, and then Napoleon. But he is not bent on any ideals. Let's put it that way. He's not going to stand by an ideal and die for it. He's, he's flexible in that nature. Now believed that Napoleon was dragging France into ruin and works behind the scenes to ensure his downfall. He is not wrong, okay? Now I say traitor kind of in a, in a like non-derogatory sort of way, but Napoleon had again refused two different peace treaties. One that let him keep basically a lot of the Netherlands um, and all of Belgium, and the second one, you lost Belgium, but you still kept France and the throne, and, and you know you weren't you weren't gonna fight really really a lot in France. He refused both times. This is, I mean, he is destroying the country. From Paris, he wrote to the Russian Emperor Alexander at Allied headquarters, informing him that in the capital, support for Napoleon was crumbling, and the city's defenses had been completely neglected. He urged the Allies to march immediately on Paris, without allowing Napoleon to distract them. Talleyrand's information was confirmed when the Allies intercepted a report from Napoleon's chief of police, General Savary, meant for the Emperor. The treasury, arsenals and powder stores are empty. We are completely at the end of our resources. The population is discouraged and discontented, wishing peace at any price. Oh, I gotta read the rest of that. Nope. <laughs> Enemies of the imperial government are sustaining and fermenting pop popular agitation. Still latent, it will become impossible to suppress unless the Emperor suc succeeds in keeping the Allies away from Paris. Wishing peace at any price. As Napoleon advanced on Saint-Dizier, the Allies sent General Witzingerode and 10,000 cavalry to harass his army and to screen their own movements. Then began their march on Paris. At Fer Champenoise, they collided with Marmont and Mortier's corps, advancing to join Napoleon. An entire National Guard division, 5,000 men, was virtually wiped out as the marshals suffered a crushing defeat. National Guard means like again they were called up. So United States again the difference, but we got the the United States got this National Guard really from France. Um, but the National Guard is basically what you raise up to defend the homeland. Um, in the United States, that's. That's what it's supposed to do. Does it do it anymore? Kind of. It's kind of just a reserve that people pulled from in Afghanistan, but we're trying to go back to it being a, we are at war, Congress has declared war, activate the National Guard. So they are, you know, reserve troops for the defense of France. Napoleon feared that the fall of Paris would be a fatal blow to his regime. His political authority and ability to wage war might not recover. Yeah. He's, he's dead on accurate. So when he received news of the Allies' movements, he tore up his plans and ordered a forced march back to Paris, intending to lead its defence in person. Napoleon's wife and son were evacuated from the capital, along with most of his ministers. As you do. Um... Whether the king stays and defends Paris, that will definitely raise the morale of the people. But the wife and the son, you must evacuate. They must continue the, the legacy and the line, regardless if the king dies there. So, in this case, Napoleon would be the king, and if he's going to fight in Paris, this, if he actually... So, fun fact, he won't get here. If he actually got to Paris in time, maybe Paris would have fought on. If he didn't order what he just did and straight went back to Paris and was like, well, I guess we're going to fight here and we're gonna, I'm going to lose my throne here. There would have been a battle of Paris. But His brother, Joseph, the ex-king of Spain, was in charge of the city's defences, but had done little. Yeah, he's, not, he's not an amazing, brilliant man. He, he really, they really did actually have a lot of time. They had around 
a month to a month and a half to prepare the defenses of Paris. Paris was awash with rumors of treachery and defeat. Marmont and Mortier were able to reach Paris before the Allies, adding their troops to the garrison. And they're going to hold Paris come hell or high water, no matter what, if they, if, you know, if France doesn't surrender first. It now totaled 37,000 men, including some hardened veterans of the Guard, but many more young conscripts, while a third were part-time soldiers of the National Guard. Yeah. And again, any wounded that are in Paris, any veterans that were out of military service are called up once again to defend Paris. If you are wounded or if you're missing an arm at this point, I mean, it's really everyone that can possibly fight is going to try to defend the capital. So in this case, Paris. Military hospitals are going to be like, if you can fight, you need to get out there. Allies had 120,000 seasoned troops. And that is why there was a lot more allies than there is defenders of Paris. Outside the city. And given the urgency of taking Paris before Napoleon could intervene, their elite guards and grenadier divisions would lead the way. On the 30th of March, they began their assault from the north. And again, they're grenadiers and they're elite troops. Again, these guys are mostly volunteers, and they are some of the best. They have a lot of training and a lot of the best equipment. So they're going to get the job done. Heavy fighting raged throughout the day. The city's defenders fought bravely, inflicting several thousand casualties on the advancing enemy. But defeat was inevitable. That night, to save Paris from destruction, Marshal Marmont agreed to surrender the city, on condition the garrison was permitted to leave with its weapons. That is a theme. A lot of generals in history, and certainly for Paris's history, have said that we will rather surrender, because that's what this is. Uh, we will surrender the city if you let me have the garrison. What that means is the garrison is going to walk out of there free, so all their troops and their equipment is walking out of there, but they will give the, the city to Par uh, Paris to the Allies. I don't need to tell you in hindsight that that's just a bad idea. Um, if they held on, even for another day, Napoleon would have been there. Um, but again, they had to make a choice, and they made it, the choice they made was to, uh, you know, hand over Paris because uh, they knew it would be destroyed. They will do so in World War II. Uh, they knew Paris was going to be, they were going to have to fight street to street in Paris. They weren't going to do so. De Gaulle kind of did want that to happen. The French people and government were not willing to let that happen, so they just handed it over. At the Hotel des Invalides, the 71-year-old Marshal Serrouillet oversaw the burning of 1,400 flags and standards captured from France's enemies, as well as Frederick the Great's sword and sash, so they would not fall into Allied hands. He burned Frederick the Great's sash and the 1,400 standards. He is a old marshal. I believe he was just basically just running the military hospital in France. That's all he really was. He was an old marshal um, from the early days of the Revolution given the title of marshal to honor him and appease people, right? Um, but he wasn't an active marshal. And again, he, he has the military wounded. He's running the hospital. He's burning all the standards. You may ask why you do this. Well, very simple. You don't let the enemy regain their honor. Um, after you, These standards are basically just a way of saying the enemy lost their honor. We, you know, ha ha, I have your flag. And rather burn it than hand it back to them. And that's what they do. And even Frederick the Great's uh, stuff. Napoleon was just 15 miles from Paris when he was informed of the city's surrender. He sat with his head in his hands for 15 minutes. We do not intend to expose Paris to the fate of Moscow. Marshal Macdonald to Napoleon at the Farbanti Farbantibalu Palace, the third of April, eighteen fourteen. Yeah, they were. They weren't, and I think Ney was actually the one that like really challenged him and like, look, we're not, we're not doing this. We're not sacrificing Paris like we did. Mo like Moscow burned for you. On 
the 31st of March 1814, France's enemies marched into Paris for the first time since the Hundred Years' War. For those of you, Hundred Years' War was around the 1300s all the way to the 1400s. It was France against England. It, that is around... 400 years? <laughs> Think about that, yeah. Parisian crowds cheered the three allied monarchs, bringers of peace. Everyone in Paris was suddenly a royalist once more. Above all, they cheered for Emperor Alexander of Russia, now hailed as Europe's savior. Oh, don't worry, that'll go to his head, the man-child he is. Don Cossacks bivouacked on the Champs-Élysées. Allied troops generally behaved well. Thirty-five miles away, Napoleon was at Fontainebleau, with 36,000 men, all of them hungry and exhausted after their 100-mile forced march. At this point, you give up. I mean, I, these guys are basically just sitting around to be like, I mean, if they go anywhere, they'll probably be shot. But I mean, at this point, they're just staying there to see the official surrender. I mean, it's over. Nevertheless, Napoleon began planning an immediate advance on Paris. But for the first time, he faced unanimous opposition from his ministers and marshals, including Ney, Macdonald, Oudinot, and Berthier. They reminded him of his oath to act for the good of France. He accused them of disloyalty. You, he took an oath to defend France against all, probably defend France against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And he is, he is, <laughs> he is putting himself before France. And these, no, they always fight for France, no matter what. All these marshals have always fought for France, but they also fight for Napoleon. You know, at the end of the day, it's it's France. France is their home, not Napoleon. Act for the good of France. He accused them of disloyalty, acting only to save themselves. They told him the war was lost, and he must abdicate in favour of his son if possible. On the 4th of April, Marshal Marmont surrendered his entire corps to the coalition, which was marched over to the enemy lines against the wishes of many of its officers and men. That is important to remember. He probably made Napoleon's son not be, uh, not the restoration of the Bourbon monarchy just failed right then and there. If he had not done that, there is a high chance, a medium to high chance, that Napoleon would have been allowed to abdicate in favor of his son and keep the title of France. So they still lose a lot of their territory, um, but Napoleon's son might have been heir. This was a devastating blow to Napoleon, and encouraged the Allies to reject his offer of a conditional abdication in favour of his son. Two days later, he abdicated without conditions. The Allied powers having proclaimed that the Emperor Napoleon is the only obstacle to the re-establishment of peace in Europe, the Emperor Napoleon, faithful to his oath, declares that he renounces, for himself and his heirs, the thrones of France and Italy, and that there is no personal sacrifice, including his life, that he is not ready to make in the interests of France. Now, regardless, that is a pretty selfless act to do so. I mean, everyone was against him, whether he would, you know, he still did sign the line that said that I abdicate and end this war for the good of France, or whatever case you may make there, he still did it. Um... Napoleon's abdication was formalized by the Treaty of Fontainebleau, by which he was allowed to keep the title of emperor, become sovereign of the small island of Elba, and retain a bodyguard of 400 men. News came too late to prevent Wellington's attack on Toulouse, leading to a costly and pointless battle, with more than 7,000 casualties. And a lot of people died there. Again, communication is not fast. Um, and again, all these people died for nothing. Sad fact, they all died for nothing. Anybody that died, died for nothing. The war's over. 
Besides glory, I guess, if you want to count that. The night after his abdication, Napoleon tried to commit suicide, using the poison that had been made for him in Russia, in case of capture. But it had lost its potency, and he survived. Two. I mean, you can understand why he would do such a thing. I mean, I mean, it's all over. I mean, everything he worked for, it's over. Weeks later, Napoleon bade farewell to his old. Okay, let me see. Is it three weeks? Let's see. Two weeks later. Napoleon bade farewell to his old guard at Fontainebleau Palace and began his journey into exile. And from what every record shows that a lot of these men did cry, um, and it makes sense, this is their emperor they'd fought for for years at this point uh, to get in this guard. So. And the guard will be disbanded, I believe. A lot of these guys are going to end up poor. And sad fact, but and began his journey into exile. I have been wrong, maybe, in my plans. I have done harm in war, but it is still all like a dream. Napoleon at Fontainebleau Palace, the 20th of April, 1814. The Napoleonic Wars, which had raged on land and sea for 11 years, seemed finally at an end. The death toll is unknown, but historians estimate that two to three million lives were lost across Europe. Most soldiers died not in battle, but from disease. Many thousands were left maimed and disfigured. And remember, these are just estimates. There is no true way to know how many were killed. And two to three million population back in 1800 was a massive population to lose. Most so And Caesar. And he was the last. There has not been one since that is, it's just too complicated basically now to do so. Um, but there has not been one since that has per, um, been a political genius and master and also a military genius at the same time and done what basically Napoleon, Caesar, and Alexander the Great did. But it seemed Napoleon's reign was to end in abject military defeat. However, Exile on Elba did not prove to Napoleon's taste. In less than 10 months, he would return to France to fight one last great campaign to reclaim his throne. So that is going to be the end of the video there. So. Yes, Napoleon's end campaign right here, one of his most brilliant, in my opinion, uh, for the defense of France. Now, uh, on your screen, it should take you to the video for Waterloo, if, if it is up. Um, otherwise, the playlist is up there. Now, the last thing, once that Waterloo video is out, there should be, after that, if you watch that, and then the time card in there and a whole bunch of other stuff, I should be, have my reaction to Waterloo 18, uh, 1970 um, up. And hopefully, we can all watch that together, so. I will see you people for the next video, and I wish you all a happy rest of your day.